Okay, nah. Okay, I just start to do some presenting uh, introduction first. Okay, let me share some of uh, this one first. Huh? Mm. Okay, can you all see my slide? Can I? Yes, okay. can. Okay, thank you. So today, uh, Andrew will assist me, okay, to do some, maybe afraid that there is a some line, uh, line problem or maybe some Q&A that I miss out. So Andrew will be assist me. Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm Jaislyn here from Penang. Today, I'm actually your facilitator of the night. So tonight, we are very lucky to have Dr. Aswin be first again. So do you all know why Dr. Aswin is here or not? So to talk about what? Suggest Sembang Sembang for Chinese New Year. No la, Dr. Aswin very busy one, no. Very hard for us to invite him to be here. So try to invite or send reminder to your friend as, uh, as many as possible, yeah? Okay, so we are going to start our presentation. First of all, let me introduce who is our Dr. Aswin, okay? So Dr. Aswin is actually a senior medical doctor with more than 12 years experience. He's actually very young, uh, but very knowledgeable and also very experienced. He served both government and also private medical sectors in Penang. Okay, uh, Dr. Aswin is from Penang and is, we are actually neighbors also. Uh. So very passionate about the functional, preventive and also nutritional medicine. So he's also strongly believed in uh, naturopathic antioxidants and also photobiomodulation therapy. Anyone from here first time heard about what bio, uh, photobiomodulation? Any? Anyone not? Uh? No, everybody know what is actually photobiomodulation with really. So Dr. Aswin no need to talk already. <laughs> okay, kidding lah. Okay, so this is something that we need to know. Everyone must know, especially during this 21st century. Eh? Okay, this is actually a new types of uh, new technology. Okay, new science of, uh, of therapy. So it is notable that Dr. Aswin is well-known speaker at many community projects health forum and also medical conference ah, okay so he's actually a very popular one so if let's say anyone miss up to tonight uh tonight's talk he will be lose okay so let's uh put our hand together to welcome dr sp doctor you want to Hi, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening, Andrew. So I think um, all of us has been through this new norm for quite some time now. And um, I think especially the children, they must be looking forward to going back to school, resuming their routine. And um, for the parents, you know, heads up to them for sticking out there and, you know, managing their children throughout this difficult period. So um, it's, it's going to be quite interesting from now onwards uh, once the vaccine is available. I think everyone is quite excited that it's already touched down and um, all of us should, should do our part, you know, to, to be responsible and um, to be able to make sure that the herd immunity is practiced while we keep on managing our SOPs. Um, and, you know, it's also a time when there will be some leniency, but at the same time, it's something to look forward to. We can look at this opportunity, even though it's a, it's a rough time, but um, it's something that, you know, we, we managed to spend some time with family and um, we can look at it on a positive note as well. So moving forward today, I'm going to be talking about something which is quite interesting. It's a combination of two therapies, two modalities which have been around for quite some time. Um, most of you, I think, quite familiar with photobiomodulation therapy by now. And um, we also have a recent addition, which is the uh, ginseng stem cell therapy. So this combination is, is quite a potent combination, effective in uh, different ways, which I'll be explaining. And um, without further ado. Thank you. 
So today we're going to be talking about the synergistic benefits of photobiomodulation therapy and ginseng stem cell therapy. So photobiomodulation therapy is a very interesting technology that has been around for quite some time. Photobiomodulation, the meaning of the word photobiomodulation. If you break it down, photo means light and bio means the in internal biology of a cell and modulation is to change that. So when you use light and you change the internal biology of the cell, that is what basically photobiomodulation therapy represents. There are a few other names. The short form for this is actually PBM, but there's also a cold laser therapy or low level laser therapy. And um, they all essentially mean photobiomodulation therapy. So this is a picture of actually how a cell looks like. Our whole body is made up of trillions and trillions of cells. So these cells are what is the building blocks. They are the basic atom of what our body is made up of. So nowadays, the focus previously in the more traditional forms of medicine, we used to focus on the systems, on the organs. But now what uh, medicine has come to realize is that actually a lot of the technology is focused on the cell in itself, the actual basic building blocks of the body. And once you make the changes to that, then the changes start to develop in other aspects. So multiple cells actually form a tissue and multiple tissues form an organ and multiple organs form a system and multiple systems form the whole human body. So once we start making changes to the cells in an organized manner, the cells start to grow and this is called cell proliferation, the growth of the cell in a healthy manner, in an organized structured manner. So the focus of photobiomodulation will be on this section here, this orange section here, which is actually the energy powerhouse of the cell, which is known as the mitochondria. So the mitochondria, it's a, it's a big sounding word, but very important for us. When we are younger, we produce a lot of ATP, otherwise known as adenosine triphosphate. So the mitochondria, which is the energy powerhouse of the cell, is the one that is responsible for producing the ATP. It is so efficient in producing ATP, which is required for all the energy functions of the cell, that from one ATP, it can multiply that eight times to form eight ATPs. So this is a very interesting technology. Like we are so advanced in terms of our cellular technology that we can actually yield from one ATP into eight ATP. So this is actually what powers our cells. And also in the mitochondria, there is a lot of genetic material. There's a lot of DNA and genetic material housed within the mitochondria. The other area which houses genetic material is the nucleus over here, which is like similar to the ECU of a car, the central component of, of the cell. So photobiomodulation focuses on the mitochondria. It actually triggers something, the light enters into the cell when we use the light on our body, enters into the cell and directly enters through the skin, penetrates into the cell and works on the mitochondria to increase something called cytochrome C oxidase. And this starts to produce more ATP and increase the functional ability of the cell to make the cell healthier and to make the cell more fitter. So once the stimulation of ATP is produced, there's more energy within the cell. And this causes a lot of multiple processes within the cell, which is dependent on ATP. One, for example, is the cell membrane. Every cell has a membrane. The membrane is the outer part of every cell. It's something like the wall around a house. So the cell membrane is where nutrients pass through, enter into the cell, and they come out through the cell, through the cell membrane. So photobiomodulation also works on the cell membrane. It actually helps to improve the function of the cell membrane to increase permeability. That means more things can enter and, and exit out and also makes the cell absorb nutrition. When we consume food, for example, plants, plants, they work through photosynthesis. So they get sunlight and that stimulates photosynthesis that produces ATP for the plants to survive. But for people, when they eat food, which contains carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, 
essentially carbohydrates, they get glucose. And glucose is one of the main forms of energy. And that is how we start producing ATP. So in order for us to be able to absorb the nutrition from the food that we eat, it's very important that our cell is functioning at an optimum level. Now, this is a 3D diagrammatic picture of how the mitochondria looks like, the energy powerhouse. So as you can see, there's all these curves inside it, and this is how it, it makes it functional and makes it um, able to yield so much of energy from it. So there's a membrane inside, and, and they have all these coils inside. So just a little um, a note about how uh, photobiomodulation first came about. The initial devices for photobiomodulation, they were many years ago, about 20 to 30 years ago. And um, the initial devices were very, very large devices. They were worth about maybe 20, 30,000 for each of the devices and uh, different technology. Nowadays, we have managed to, to make the technology into something which is very convenient. So it can actually be used in a, in a home setting. Previously, to have to go to a center to utilize the benefits, it would be something that is required maybe on a two to three time weekly basis or once a month basis. But now with the convenience of having it as a home device, it is much easier to use it and it can be used on a multiple um, time frame. It can be used, you know, three, four, five, even six times a day. There's no upper limit and there's no risk of any adverse effects. So the photobiomodulation therapy is a very interesting technology. It has been used on a multitude of um, uh, disease conditions to show to me have some significant benefit to help. And mainly the concept will be by working on the cells. So the benefit of certain technologies, um, Iron Laser has, has utilized um, a stringent uh, methodology which has allowed it to to go through many rigorous testing processes so for example for it to become a certified medical device it had to go through four stages of testing which took a period of about four years but this technology is not just incorporating photobiomodulation therapy it's also incorporating acupuncture ter technology as well as magnet therapy so a combination of these three modalities actually make it more effective. Acupuncture is something that has been around for about 2,000 years. Very, very old um, technology, which is still being used until now. And most people have to go to centers to use uh, acupuncture, and it can be quite uh, uncomfortable and painful, and it involves needles. So there's also an aspect of hygiene. So in our body, we have these invisible lines, which are known as the meridian lines. There's roughly about 12 to 14 of these lines in our body. And acupuncture points, there's about 360 to up to 2,000 acupuncture points in our body. So these acupuncture points, they run through our body um, throughout generating energy. Like in Ayurvedic medicine, it's referred to as chakras. And in Western medicine, it's referred to as milieu interior but essentially all the same. So when you have something on the wrist, which is um, directed towards an acupressure point, which is known as the P6 point or the pericardium point or the newborn point, that is the one that is known to be the inner gateway, which is directed to the heart directly. So now I'm gonna be shifting the focus over to something known as wild ginseng wild ginseng stem cells. Wild ginseng stem cells is something that contains a lot of ginsenocytes. Wild ginseng has been around for a very, very long time. In fact, ever since the Chinese dynasty, many years ago, uh, emperors had uh, wild ginseng as something which is very exclusive for them. Something that's very hard to obtain and something which is in high demand, but very limited in uh, quantity. So on average, the ability to harvest wild ginseng is roughly only about six kilograms per whole year in the whole of China. But some emperors, they lived until 80s and 90 years old, consuming large quantities of wild ginseng on a yearly basis. The important property about wild ginseng 
when you divide it, ginseng is essentially divided into wild ginseng as well as farm ginseng or cultivated ginseng. The wild ginseng is very exclusive, very rare, and very hard to obtain. It has to be get uh, uh, taken from the mountains. Um, it's usually um, quite scarce and very limited in quantity. The harvested and cultivated ginseng is more easily and readily available. Also, the wild ginseng is much, much more expensive compared to the cultivated ginseng. The longer the ginseng is, the more it has this property called ginsenocytes. And the wild ginseng used in CV8 is uh, approximately 70 years old, which is, which is considered very old for ginseng because the ginseng category is usually divided to less than four years old, four to six years old, and more than six years old. So 70 years old is, 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 is very senior, you can say, a very uh, superior quality uh, wild ginseng. And so that means the properties of the ginsenocyte is very dense. So this ginsenocyte is actually something which is a therapeutic ingredient. It has a lot of medicinal benefits and uh, medicinal properties. Among the ginsenocytes that we are going to be discussing about is RG3, RK1, RG5, RH2, RH3, PPD, and something called compound K. So all these are basically the components contained within the wild ginseng that give it its medical benefits. So ginseng is actually what is referred to as an adaptogen. There are not many uh, um, herbs or supplements out there which are adaptogens. One of it is ginseng. Another one is known as ashwagandha. Uh, ginseng being an adaptogen, it helps to, to balance out the immune system. So when the immune system is over-functioning, it helps to calm down the immune system. And when the immune system is under-functioning or immunocompromised, it helps to stabilize, to increase the immune system. So all this in terms helps to reduce the stress to the internal environment of the cell. Now, stress is actually a major component of our lifestyle in the 21st century. So there's a lot of damaging effects to stress onto the cells that can cause aging and disease. So stress, stress comes from a lot of various different things. Um, it comes from pollution, from air pollution, from even water pollution. That's why some of us use um, various types of filters and different quality of water. It can be from first-hand or second-hand cigarette smoke. It can be from damage to the DNA. It can be from even over-exercising can cause uh, some amount of stress to the body. It can be from lack of sleep. It can be from uh, work stress, family stress, spouse stress, husband and wife stress. And all this actually causes increase in aging and it's also linked to disease. So disease is actually one of the major components that have been linked to causing disease is actually excessive amounts of stress. And stress is not the stress that we perceive to be something that we go through um, um, a stressful event and that, that kind of a stress. The stress that I'm talking about is the stress on the internal environment of the cell that causes something which is called reactive oxidation species, ROS. So ROS are unstable atoms within our cells that start to cause damage to stress. And one of the side effects and the byproducts of stress are diseases like diabetes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, increased aging, and even cancer. So ginseng is one of the strongest adaptogens around and very effective to counter the damaging effects of stress. So we can't run away from stress. We have to deal with stress, but having um, a good diet that is low in processed foods, low in um, fried foods or oily foods, you know, using good cooking oil, things like that will help to reduce the stress in doing sufficient amount of exercise and getting sufficient amount of sleep at least seven to eight hours. These are the things that we can control. But to some extent, we also do need the need of certain supplements that will help to boost up the functional capacity of our cells. So now a combination of these two technologies synergistically working together will be something which is quite interesting and for our body to, to utilize. So we combine the use of photobiomodulation along with wild ginseng 
and they combine have a synergistic effect. Now, why is CV8 um, wild ginseng different from other ginsengs? In the sense that one, it is it is very old. It is seventy years old, which is considered very old, and and in and it was roughly about fifty thousand US to to purchase this this ginseng. Another thing is the technology. The company behind uh, CV8 in Korea um, is uh, Plantel. Plantel stands for Plant Intelligence. So they first started the research about 12 years ago, and they worked along with the Chinese Academy of Sciences with uh, Professor Jesse Jin, who's also uh, one of the heads of uh, the artificial intelligence in, um, in Beijing. And along with other professors from Australia, from UK, from US, and from Korea, they have combined um, a lot of technology and a lot of research into their products. And they wanted to target about 10 uh, countries, um, creating very high quality products, which are very affordable and effective. So the, the beauty about wild ginseng is um, having a, a good ingredient. And then the good ingredient leads to an effective formula that has a good effective result. So CV8 actually stands for cell vitality. And the eight is actually representing infinity. And the reason being is that uh, they have managed to be the only company in the world to, to get the technology of using uh, CMC cells. So these CMC cells are actually the, the original cell of the plant, which is actually the, the immortal cell of the plant. And they are the cells that keep on differentiating and they still maintain their youthfulness. They do not change their structure. Some um, technologies that involve stem cells are actually using what we refer to as DDC, or DDC is actually the, the wound healing type of cells. So the CMC, which is the cambium marismatic stem cells, are the origin leaf bud and the youngest cells, the cells that are undifferentiated. Undifferentiated means that they can virtually change into any form of cell and they can convert to any form of cell. They haven't haven't gone through that change yet of being a aged cell. So they are still in a youthful state. So using a special uh, methodology um, technique where they, they get um, a Petri dish and then they put it into these special bioreactors and the bioreactors are then fed a specialized nutrition. And using this technology, they increase the yield and production of the wild ginseng and cultivate it and harvest it in a, in a method where they still maintain the original um, component of the wild ginseng and the ginsenocytes is still maintained in its original form. So using this technology, they're actually like 3D printers. They can replicate the stem cell in its original form to, to make it up to about something like 8 million kilograms of um, wild ginseng production, as opposed to the six kilograms, which can be harvested um, on a yearly basis if it is taken directly from the mountain. So they've actually managed to patent this technology and utilize it to produce large amounts, but still um, maintaining it in its original state. So this is um, exclusive to them. And to my knowledge, there's no other company that has this technology of replicating um, the cells in its original plant state. So together with um, photobiomodulation technology, they work together to improve the cells and increase the function of the cells. And they make the cell, when the cell functions in an effective way, they are more efficient to carry out its tasks and they are more effective. So this is the secret of one plus one, and that would equal to 11. So as mentioned, a um, basic building block is cells and cells form a tissue. For example, our lung. Our lung is made up of a cell called the alveoli and multiple alveoli, they, they form into lung tissue. And then the organ is the lung, the bronchus and the esophagus and the system will be the respiratory system. And the respiratory system together will combine to form the human body. So some of the, the conditions that we are going to be talking about 
is uh, diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus is very rampant in um, around the world and in Malaysia and in uh, Southeast Asia. Diabetes mellitus is um, quite a common condition. It's actually linked to some amount of inflammation um, linked to dietary um, and uh, lifestyle habits and also to a genetic component. So essentially, the common type of diabetes that we uh, experience here in Malaysia is mainly diabetes type 2. There's also another type of diabetes called diabetes type 1 or juvenile onset. But diabetes type 2 is the one that we most commonly see where people take medications and eventually when the medications are less effective, they have to take uh, insulin injections. So when our body consumes carbohydrates or glucose, like example, a meal of rice, so that converts into glucose in our bloodstream and this gets absorbed um, by our cells and that converts into energy or ATP. But for some people, the ability for the body to absorb this glucose is limited. One is because the pancreas does not produce enough insulin. So the insulin is actually like a transporter. It's like a car that carries the passenger, which is the glucose, into the cell. But when the insulin production by the pancreas is not sufficient, then the glucose level in the blood starts to go up. Also, another methodology is the glucose cannot enter the cell because there's some kind of a resistance from the cell and the insulin cannot work by entering into the cell. So uh, one of the methods um, this synergistic um, capacity may have is to reduce the insulin resistance, which increases the absorption of glucose and the metabolism of glucose. So the uptake of sugar from the blood vessel that goes into the cell is increased. And then the blood, when we take our blood, we prick ourselves with the machine and we check the sugar, the levels are reduced because of the amount of sugar that is contained within the blood. So this also increases the sensitivity of insulin. So more insulin can be transporting the sugar out of the blood vessel into the cell. And this helps to reduce diabetes and its complications. So for cancer, cancer is quite a rampant problem nowadays, um, partly because of our diet and the amount of stress levels and um, people who have uh, things like uh, gastritis and constipation issues and also a genetic component and essentially a lifestyle. So one of the things is that um, the synergistic effect may be able to have an anti-tumor effect in whereby it can increase the number of natural killer cells or the NK cells. And the NK cells have also been known to uh, fight off viruses. It's part of our immune system. So we have an adaptive immune system, which helps to fight off um, these cells which are unwanted in our body. And this helps to reduce the number of tumor cells. So there's something called cell apoptosis. Cell apoptosis is programmed cell death where the cells start dying off. So the immune cells target the cancer cells and then they start killing them off one by one. Cancer is something somewhat akin to mushrooms, wild mushrooms growing in a garden where they, they start mushrooming, they start spreading and they start increasing. So when the, there's an ability to arrest the uncontrolled growth of these cells, then this will inhibit the further spread of the cancer. Another methodology is angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is um, blood vessels. Cancer survives on a lot of blood vessels, like leaching off blood vessels. So by reducing um, the blood supply to the cancer cells, there's no blood supply for the cancer to grow where it gets its nutrition to get bigger and larger. So once the cancer cells have their blood supply cut off, like cutting off the roots of a tree, then the cancer cells start to die off. So there is um, another condition which is called high lipids, which all of us are familiar with, which is basically high cholesterol. So cholesterol is something um, that we divide it when we do a blood test. We divide it to our total cholesterol, our triglycerides, our good cholesterol known as the HDL, and our LDLs, our low-density lipoproteins. So one of the main components of cholesterol, which is what people take cholesterol medicine for, is something called triglycerides. And triglycerides are a form of fat 
that actually um, will will cause problems to our body and they tend to get stuck to certain parts of our blood vessels. So in order to break down the, the fat, we have to reduce the fat cells. And in order to reduce the fat cells, they are the ones that store the triglycerides. So less triglycerides, it helps to reduce the cholesterol levels in the body. Stroke. Stroke is also known as a cerebral vascular uh, accident. And um, one of the major causes, there are two types of strokes. There's a hemorrhagic stroke and there's an ischemic stroke where there's lack of blood supply. Usually stroke will be where there's lack of blood supply to certain parts of the brain. And one of the methods it may be able to help is to reduce that area of lack of blood supply to the brain. And then sometimes there can be a lot of inflammation in that area, which causes um, the brain to swell up and which is referred to as brain edema. And this helps to reduce the oxidative stress to the area of the brain and reduces the inflammatory markers. So this has a benefit to protect the brain and improve the learning and memory function. So it's one of the forms to uh, may be able to help in rehabilitating after a stroke. Hypertension. Hypertension is high blood pressure. Nowadays, we see people in their 20s also having a high blood pressure and you know, one of the common causes is uh, work stress. So hypertension, hypertension is uh, improves, it can be improved with uh, when we have better blood flow. And better blood flow means increased vasodilatation. So we have all these blood vessels in our body and the blood vessels are the ones that carry oxygen within our body. And oxygen is actually a very vital component of our body for all our organs to function. If you look at athletes, a lot of the professional athletes, including um, you know, um, Cristiano Ronaldo and um, Kobe Bryant, they, they use a methodology which is uh, involving um, something called the hyperbaric uh, chamber. So the hyperbaric chamber is actually a chamber that they go into and they, they start um, uh, rejuvenating the function of their muscles and their cells and their ligaments tendons and even bones that have been damaged through a sports injury and also helps to increase the function of their brain so that they can be more uh, functional and also helps to increase the recovery and rejuvenation of their organs. So oxygen therapy is something that is actually linked to photobiomodulation. So photobiomodulation actually helps to increase the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. And when that happens, then there will be increase in the endothelial function so the blood vessels actually start to get bigger and there's more blood supplying to the organs. And when there's more blood to the organs, then the blood pressure starts to go down. There's more oxygen to the organs and the, and the organs start to function at a more optimal level. So oxygen is actually very vital. It's one of the newer methodologies that is being used to treat patients. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy is about a thousand ringgit per session. It's very costly. It's very, um, those, those machines used um, are about half a million dollars to, for each of those machines. So that is using uh, oxygen therapy to increase the blood circulation in the body. So um, there's a lot of um, supplements nowadays that are actually using something called um, arginine that stimulates the nitric oxide production. So this is actually also linked to photobiomodulation therapy and uh, stem cells. Heart disease. So heart disease, um, there's a component of antioxidation. Antioxidation is something that um, will actually help to reduce the heart disease. So they've done a study on a group of people who have uh, had a acute myocardial infarction, otherwise known as a heart attack. And um, that's when there's lack of blood supply to certain muscles in the heart. And they've noticed that there's a 50% uh, improvement in the blood supply to the heart muscles, which have been having previously lack of blood supply after using photobiomodulation therapy for a period of up to six weeks. So this actually reduces the damage to those cells that are dying and not getting enough oxygen within the heart. So these are examples of free radicals, which I was talking about earlier, which is the reactive oxidation species. We get it from excessive amounts of sunlight, from ionizing radiation, smoking, from air pollution, water pollution, from inflammation, 
and even uh, damage to the DNA, and all this causes damage to the DNA. So this combination, importantly, is uh, very safe because it's um, um, iron laser is one of those devices, um, the only device in, in uh, Malaysia that has actually got a certified medical device uh, and recognized um, as a certified medical device, which um, had to go through um, all the st stringent testings. And that makes it uh, certified that it, it is safe and uh, compliant to the requirements. Every part of the device has been tested and uh, uh, stringently gone through rigorous uh, processing. So it's also uh, something that is very um, good to improve the effectiveness of our cell health. And uh, Singapore has invested uh, millions of dollars in uh, cell health, cell technology nowadays. That is the future of where medicine is heading to, um, including stem cells and even artificial intelligence. So together, they are working synergistically. And this helps to improve the general health, uh, reduce the risk of disease and illness, and improve the quality of our life. Thank you very much. So I hope you enjoyed that talk. And um, if uh, anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. OK, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ashwin. Now, um, I'm sure uh, Dr. Ashwin has given you some brief idea of how the combination of uh, this ion laser and CVA can give you the synergistic effect. Effect. Now, of course, now it's open. Now it's open for Q and A. Now I'll be assisting um, Dr. Ashwin. Now, if you do have any questions that you want to ask or any health issue related with, uh, to whether IM laser or CVA can help, uh, Dr. Ashwin is here to help you to answer the questions, to help us to answer the questions, actually. Okay, so uh, now it's open for Q&A now. Uh, if anyone who wants to ask uh, Dr. Ashwin any question, you just raise out your hand, then I will, I will just unmute you so that uh, you can ask directly uh, the questions, yeah? Anyone, do you have any questions or anything, whether it is regarding IM laser or whether it is regarding CVA or any health issue? I, uh, Dr. Ashwin and I will be helping uh, to answer your, your query, yeah? Now it's open for Q&A. Or if you, if you don't want to ask directly, you can always type inside the chat and we will look at the chat and we will answer your questions one by one. Yeah, uh, someone is raising their hand. So I will, uh, Anthony Ching, okay. And, okay, Anthony Ching, you are unmuted already. Thank you. Anthony, yeah, yeah. Andrew? Yeah, hi. Doctor, 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 good evening. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, Anthony, I can hear you. Okay. I just visited a brain cancer patient. Okay. She went through the first uh, chemotherapy, all right, and now resting at home, all right, and the parents believe that our IM laser can help. Okay. Right. This lady is just early 40s. The, the patient. Now, right. uh, so I, I I hope I'm right. I asked them to start with uh, uh, three bars and uh, twice a day initially. Okay. I was thinking of target treatment. Is there any target treatment for them, doctor? So the, the, the tumor is a, a brain tumor? Honestly, I do not know whether it's tumor or what. So the location because of the cancer is in the brain. Brain, brain. Right. So uh, one of the targeted methods, it, it essentially because the chemotherapy is ongoing, so ideally it would be beneficial to use it on the wrist and also to use the nose piece because the nose piece works on the stem cells in the nose as well as in the brain. So that is one mm -hmm. of the methods. That, um, you can just use it on a general scale 
Um, has the chemotherapy been completed? No, only the first, first uh, round. They right. were supposed to go for the second round. I was I understand that the they told her they told the parents that she's a little weak. So gotta wait a while for the second round. Yeah, so in, in that event it would be um utilizing um a combination of a good diet and then um the utilization of um uh, CV8 and the laser technology combined together uh, would be advisable in order to help increase the appetite, increase the mood, improve the sleep, and um, to be able to, to benefit. But the chemotherapy um, would be dependent on the oncologist. Um, and usually they, they see how the condition of the patient is to handle it. Um, in terms of the photobiomodulation therapy, I recommend to use it on the wrist um, along with the nose line. So to use that at least two to three times a day, um, three bar. Three bars, huh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, is it good to suggest to use it uh, sort of targeted treatment on the temple? Um, for oh. the time, uh, I would advise to, to just use it on the wrist and um, with the nose line until the chemotherapy uh -huh. treatment is completed. Because I think the focus will be on improving the patient's general well-being and health right now. Okay. Yeah. So once do, the patient, do, uh, the, main, the main aim would be to get the patient to be able to improve their appetite, to improve their energy levels, and then they can continue to complete the chemotherapy. The the laser would be a uh, adjunct, which means that it would um, go hand in hand with the usage of the chemotherapy. So um, the chemotherapy would still be mm -hmm. ideal to be completed, and in order to do that the patient would have to be healthier state. Good. Okay, Thanks sorry, a lot, doc. Dr. Doctor, doctor, can I just add a point of note uh, for endometrium? Yes, okay, for the target treatment, usually it is mainly for the fast relief of pain management as well as uh, inflammation. So the best way, like what uh, the doctor has recommend you, the best way is actually by wearing on the wrist and nose uh, and use it together with CV8 as well. Yeah, the best way is still wearing on the wrist and nose. For any uh, target treatment, is more to the fast relief of pain and inflammation. Uh, so, Anthony, you, you, you can see the difference between wearing on the wrist and target treatment? Yes, noted. Yeah. yeah. Noted, noted. Yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot. No, no problem. No problem. You're welcome. So, any more questions? Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, no, I'm not Dr. <laughs> Dr. Ashwin. <laughs> I know. I said that. thank you, Doc, and thank you, Andrew. Uh, oh, I thought you said doctor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any more questions? Um, as I'm, as uh, who has uh, Jessalyn has mentioned just now, it's not easy for us to get uh, our doctor Ashwin uh, to share with us all these things. So, if you do have any questions regarding the pora or any health issue, please do so because oh, someone is sorry, yeah. Uh? Uh, yes, Rama, you are online, no. Rama. Yes, yeah, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh that uh, they, they go back to the case of this uh, cancer just now. Just wondering. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Just wondering whether, uh, I I was wondering whether I uh, can we use the hand and then the nose one while the, the treatment is going on or must wait for two, three months before we can use the hand and nose uh, and CV8? Yeah. You, can, you can use it. Um... In, in terms of improving the general health. It's not recommended when the ongoing cycle um, immediately after the ongoing cycle. So a gap of about one to two weeks is, is, is quite safe. So when the person is on the day that they're going for the treatment, um, actively going for the chemo, actively going for the radiotherapy, on, on those days, uh, it would be advisable to, to not use it uh, simultaneously. But given a week's gap, uh, that would be suitable for it to be used. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 
The next one is Anthony again, got some question to ask. Yes, Anthony. Okay, uh, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, I also have another uh, encounter, all right? This uh, lady, she sort of lost her hearing on one side of the ear, and uh, the hearing was tested, only got 10%. Okay. Now, uh, besides doing the wrist and nasal, is there any target treatment for this uh, hearing problem? So uh, she can she can there are testimonies there are testimonies of people Sorry? who there are testimonies of people who have used it um, for hearing problems. It would actually depend on the what the cause of the hearing loss is, but they they are people who have uh, previously used um, the laser device by inserting the nasal piece into the ear and directly using it um, in the ear. The the laser is actually what we refer to as a 3R laser or a GAAIA laser. It's, it's a very safe laser. So they can even use the nasal line, you know, three to four bar targeted therapy in the ear and try to see at least about twice to three times a day, see if they can achieve um, um, increase in their hearing. One of the best methods is to actually do conduct a hearing test or a audiology test and then use the, the device consistently for over a span of about two months and then go back and repeat the audiology testing because sometimes to gauge these things just by um, assessment may be a bit vague, but to, to do a testing before and after uh, may be more accurate for her to actually see if there's a benefit on her hearing. So she can use it directly in the ear. Uh, so how, how many times a day would you suggest, doctor? Two to three times a day, uh, three to four bars. I get three. Targeted treatment, yeah. Uh, three or four times? Yes. Okay. Because that is on the, uh, say, say the left side, the hearing is lost. So you only put it on the left side, right? Yes. Um, if the, the other year, she's done a audiology testing, a hearing testing, the other year is a good year, then uh, she wouldn't need to use it. Normally, um, on the medical side, when a person has hearing loss in uh, two years, normally the hearing devices will be focused on the ear with better hearing. But in this case, if her, her other ear is um, a good ear, then uh, she can focus it on the affected ear. Uh -huh. Okay. So we place it on the affected ear. Lah. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Actually, uh, the, the testing was done quite some time ago. Right. Ah. So another really? method that is um, a little bit um, maybe more convenient is um, she, can, she, can, she can watch something that is recorded on her TV and she can put it at a specific volume and then gauge how clear it is. And then after about one to two months, she can watch the same thing again at the specific volume and then she can test and mm -hmm. see if it's, it's clearer for her. So she can use that method mm -hmm. also, which is it's a more rough method, but um, can also be used to assess. Yeah, understand. Okay. Thanks, Doc. Okay. Uh, okay, any more questions, ladies and gentlemen? So far, three person. Uh, any more questions that you want to ask Dr. Ashring? Or if, if there's any question regarding the products or CV8, uh, such as CV8 and I'm a laser, you want to know more, you can Hello. always ask us. Yeah. There's a some question inside the Okay, uh, there's a question that came in. Uh, can a stage four lung cancer who is on daily oral chemo consume capsule by mouth use eye laser? Ongoing chemo, usually I advise to complete the chemo first and then after that uh, to use the, the laser device after the chemo is completed. If it's an ongoing daily chemo, wait for the cycle to complete, wait for a week and then after a week uh, can start using both the photobiomodulation as well as CV8. Okay, Kim. Any more questions? 
this sample can still uh, still more. Okay, this is a condition that the sun is going to take about. Anyone else who have any question? Andrew, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, can you see the message? So there's a question for some diabetic patients. If their blood sugar level is oh. slightly high, say 7 to 8, and why and how can IM laser help oh, okay, uh, okay. these kind of patients? So for blood sugar, blood sugar for diabetic patients, um, 7 to 8, ideally what we try to look at on a on a on a level is um, when you fast for six hours, we try to target less than five point six, and after a person has taken a, a normal meal plus the two hours, we will try to target uh, less than seven point eight. So this is just a general uh, guide. So if the level is um, say um, more than more than eight, for example, two hours after a meal, then there's a possibility that the person could have uh, diabetes. And uh, we may want to go for another testing called a HbA1c, which is a test that sees a three months value of uh, how accurate our diabetic levels are. So how it works is it actually works on um, pushing out the sugar from our blood vessels and, and directing it into the cells. And the other method it works is it helps to, to increase the production of insulin and insulin is a transporter that carries the glucose out. So in turn, the blood sugar level may be able to go down after a few weeks to a few months. Of course, combined with a good diet and um, um, exercise regime. Okay. Okay, James. Okay, the next question is from Jamie. Uh, she's understand that laser therapy is effective for shingles. Uh, is it advisable to take CVA simultaneously or to consume it after the sing shingles blister have, have dried up? Thank you. It's advisable to take both uh, simultaneously. So shingles is a, is a virus uh, caused by herpes zoster and um, it, can, it can be quite painful. So um, CVA does have an anti-inflammatory effect along with the photobiomodulation. It also has an anti-inflammatory effect where it can work on uh, the pain fibers um, and these delta pain fibers, once they, they are targeted, they can actually help to reduce the pain of the shingles. And on the aspect of um, the immune function, they can also help, may be able to help to balance off the immune function where they can help to stabilize the immune function. And um, shingles does cause um, the immunity to be reduced. Also shingles can happen in people who have a lower immune function. So it, it can be beneficial to use both a laser as well as a CB8 in order to boost up the immune function and prevent further attacks. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from Joe Tan. Okay, uh, he, uh, he says, in our ginseng tonic sachet, how many percent of the ginseng versus the three fruits? Okay, diabetes can consume ginseng, right? Maybe, uh, Dr. Uh, yes. Ashwin, maybe you diabetes. just answer whether the diabetic can uh, consume ginseng or not. Uh. Yeah. So essentially, one packet is uh, 60 ml, 60 ml per packet of CV8. And in that is about 3.5 ml of uh, rare ginsenocytes. Uh, those ones that I mentioned, RG1, RG2. So these rare ginsenocytes are 3.5 ml. And... Percentage-wise, it's about 5 to 6% of uh, rare ginsenocytes. And that's about um, 8 uh, roots of uh, ginseng in, in one sachet. So the other things that it contains is uh, pomegranate, seabuckthorn, uh, aronia, and um, combination with the ginseng. Okay. Uh, can diabetes so can, consume can ginseng? Diabetes. Can be used for yeah. diabetes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay. Uh, I just add on a bit. Uh, for the CV8, uh, for our uh, this uh, so, uh CV8, why we combine with uh three other fruits such as the sibatong, aronia berries, as well as pomegranate mainly is because they have uh because of this special formulation. 
Now, the rare ginseng set will require a high antioxidant to preserve it. That is why the Sibatong as well as the Aronia berries will help to actually preserve the uh, rare ginseng oocyte that is from the uh, ginseng uh, stem cell. And of course, the other things like Aronia berries, uh, the best antioxidant if you compare with all the berries, the highest anti antioxidants. And it also contains a lot of manganese, manganese, high content of manganese. Manganese actually helps in conversion of uh, protein and all those things, uh, which into the whatever things that our body can absorb easily. That is why it actually helps to um, improve the absorption rate. Uh, okay, <laughs> just to add on for your info. Lah. That is why the these three fruits act together, there's a purpose. It's not that we just mix them uh, for the sake of mi mixing them, but there's a purpose for, for it, yeah? Okay, um, the next question, uh, okay. Uh, Doctor, uh, James just now was talking about the sugar level is slightly high, say seven to eight, seven to eight in the morning. Like there is actually, uh, he is actually talking about in the morning, especially in the morning, lah. The the uh, right. blood sugar is a bit, yeah. Yeah. So, so um, if you're talking about um morning before meal, that means the overnight fasting seven to eight is considered uh, high. So um, I would recommend if a HP A one C is not done to to try to get that done, and then uh from there uh start uh, looking into treatment if uh, not already on treatment for the diabetes as well as um, to combine it with the uh, laser as well as CV8. Okay, James. Okay, any more questions? Any more questions? Otherwise, um, I, I will have to let uh, doctor go because he just finished work. <laughs> Immediately came over here. Okay, uh, a person, uh, Elaine is asking if a person has a normal BP or low BP, will the combination usage of IM laser and CVA cause BP lower? So there are some people initially uh, when they have low BP, they, they do feel a little bit uh, lightheaded, but um, usually over time the body starts to adapt. So <clears throat> it would be recommended to start off with a lower bar for the laser and uh, then slowly increase um, until they feel comfortable. So the combination is actually very safe, even for people with uh, low blood pressure, because uh, CV8 has the ginsenocytes, which have the adaptogen um, capacity, so it can adapt accordingly to see what the body's requirements are. So it's safe to, to use both for patients with uh, low blood pressure. Okay, Elaine, uh, the other question just came in. Uh, my husband is now on radiation. Is he allowed to use IM laser from IV? Sorry, I didn't get that. Um, um, radiotherapy, is it? Uh, yeah. IV, are you referring to radiotherapy? Um, so, he... Assuming that the radiation is a radiotherapy, we, we would normally recommend to... Uh, hold on until the radiotherapy is completed and then uh, wait for at least a week to two weeks to start um, the usage of uh, laser and the CD8. We'd rather um, just use the uh, radiation treatment on its own until uh, it's complete. Okay. Uh, okay, Ivy. Uh, yes, uh, Ivy was referring to radiotherapy just now. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? If not, then we will finish off the, the uh, Q&A session here. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ashwin. Thank you very uh, and much. Of course, uh, thank you for your time because I know you are, you are having a busy schedule, but uh, in fact, you still, uh, we invite you, you still make up your time to come over here uh, to share with all these people. No worries. 
Yeah. Thank, thanks so to thank Andrew, you so much. And thanks to uh, Salim and yeah. Adam. Justin, and, uh, yeah, just selling as well. And uh, if there is no more question, we will. Oh, there is one more coming in. I saw. <laughs> sorry, sorry, doctor. We always try to finish, but suddenly there is always. Uh... <laughs> okay, Rama. Yes, yeah. last one, Rama. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, a friend of mine yeah. is for liver. He has got liver, you know, prob uh, this cancer, and went for TACE treatment. Um, so they say the TFC treatment will be like there's a gap of about two three months and come back again. So in between, in between the gap, so one week can he use our laser LCBA? Yes, actually, uh, recommended to use it in between the treatment, so he can gap for about a week, and uh, in between the the period, he can use a combination of both the the laser uh, therapy as well as uh, CB8 and in combination together. So he can use a laser three to four times a day and CV8 uh, between three to six sachets a day. Sorry, sorry, just wondering. You were saying earlier that I was just wondering, just wondering that is that we say unless you finish the whole treatment, we cannot use uh we cannot use this uh, IM laser or CV8. But he has got like that's, uh, that's for day to day therapy or ongoing therapy of uh, chemo or radiotherapy. Oh I Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Rama. Thank you. Andrew. Okay. Thank you so much for everyone uh, for participating. I have to uh, finish off the meeting here because uh, Dr. Ashwin, I'm sure he is tired already. So uh, we hope that for the next time we can continue invite inviting uh, Dr. Ashwin to come over here to share with us on the meanwhile um, on behalf of the company um, once again Kong Si Fa Chai I wish you all a very happy new year and remember uh, now it's still MCO for a lot of places so stay safe stay healthy and use IM laser and CVA every day and of course, we also want to thank you once again, Dr. Ashwin, as well as Jesseling, for uh, being a facilitator. And we should see you again next time. Okay, we we'll see you again, hopefully next month, if Dr. Ashwin's schedule is okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank and you. Thank bye you bye. So much, Good everyone. night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashwin. Thank you, Jesseling.